During 1931, America was in the grips of the Great Depression. Armies of the unemployed took to the road in search of work, their lives uncertain, often tragic, their determination always strong. It was a time when Americans demonstrated the true measure of their pride and spirit. And nowhere was this vitality more evident than in the plans to build a giant dam to tame the Colorado River, a structure the likes of which had never before been attempted. Hoover Dam wasn't a 30s public works project. It had been in the legislative process since the early 1920s, and in the minds of the dreamers for more than half a century. The men who built the dam and the women who helped to pioneer the desert take their places among all those Americans who have used their ingenuity and the sweat of their brows to perform the impossible. These are the memories of some of those people. Known as Boulder Dam, until the name was officially changed in 1947, Hoover Dam required the largest labor contract ever let by the U.S. government up to that time. The bid was awarded to the six companies incorporated. Steve Bechtel, who served as one of that company's directors, and whose father, W.A. Bechtel, served as president, remembers how they got involved. When Boulder was first talked of, conceived by the government, and there was considerable press comments of what, what was going to happen or when it was going to happen. I discussed it with my father and with Henry Kaiser. Meanwhile, my dad back to my father had been uh, talking with his friends in the Utah Construction Company. I believe that they approached dad on it. And uh, dad talked with Henry Kaiser, who was our equal partner in our Bechtel Kaiser Company Limited and about whether we ought to be interested in it or not. We did emerge that we were interested. The Utah Construction Company, who were the, really the, the core around which this thing was originally conceived, and with Morris and Knutson, and then with some others who became, later became members of the group, uh, they decided to put together a joint venture first, later on a, the corporation, Six Companies, Inc. Bids were received in, in Denver, and of course, there's considerable excitement among our group. The night before, there's a big debate on as to whether we should put on a little or take off a little. And, but there was no problem arriving at a number that we're all in accord with. We all knew it was a big job, an important job. It had to be done well. We'd bet our shirts on it. Everybody felt that working on Boulder, they'd get a certain amount of expertise that they probably hadn't all had before. And there's a way it worked out. From that group of people that were there, came some of the strongest men uh, that they, in the construction industry ever. Once the six companies signed the contract with the government, the rush was on to begin construction. Americans desperately needed the jobs. The many months of publicity about the dam had brought hundreds of men, some of them with their families and possessions from all over the nation to Black Canyon to sit in the heat and to wait. Irma Godby and her husband arrived later than most, June of 1931. They brought with them their four small children. The six company camp was, uh, it was a tent camp and it was about where our Boulder City Airport is now. And uh, so we asked there and they said, well, you'll just have to go on down to the river bottom, uh, which was Williamsville, but it was nicknamed Ragtown. And, uh, it was named Williamsville for the ranger whose name was Williams, who was in charge of it. And the reason it was Ragtown is because it was made of rags. Anything that anybody had to make a shade, they used. Now, the very first night, why we all just laid down on the desert and slept there, I, I had uh, some baby mattresses and the little baby uh, crib for my uh, baby that was five, uh, five months old so she was up off the ground but the rest of us were all on the ground and uh, we didn't have a tent and it was about three days before we did have a tent but uh, 
we hung my uh, good wool blankets that I had gotten from um, Utah Woolen Mills and paid 32 bucks a pair for them, pinned with horse blanket pins to clothesline rope that we had uh, uh, fastened to poles in the um, ground. And that was shade. We didn't have any furniture or anything. I did. Now, why I took my ironing board on top of the old car is more than I know, because I had no way in God's green earth to iron. But I had my ironing board, so when we got a hold of a couple of um, powder boxes, why I let, put the ironing board across them, and then I had a bench. And if you got more powder boxes, why you uh, dug a hole in the ground and you put a powder box down in the ground and tried to keep something a little bit cool if you had shade above it. Actually, the shade did very little to help that first summer. Temperatures broke 26-year records. Still, there was a construction camp to build, one which at its height would be the second largest city in Nevada. Even before Boulder City was completed, work had begun in the canyon. Once access roads and railroad beds had been blasted out of the canyon walls, work began on the four diversion tunnels. Red Wixon, who was a shovel runner at the time and is now retired and living in Boulder City, describe some of the innovative methods used during construction. Well, of course, you talk about the tunnels. Uh, the first thing that uh, was important, you got to divert a river before you can build a dam. So the uh, diversion tunnels was mostly uh, four tunnels. There's over 4,000 foot of each, and a quite a major job been for them themselves. Jumbo is a Big Mac truck with a big bunch of steel frame on it, and it helped. 25 water liners, and each machine needed two men, which means that there was 50 men. The jumbo would only, even at, the, at that size, we'd go into one side of the tunnel and drill it out, and then we'd have to back down and go over to the other side. And we, in other words, you had to make two setups. 